right, guys. Um, thank you all for coming, uh, for bringing your gifts and your contribution. We're going to have a friendly conversation uh, that really extends from my remarks just before the break about uh, unique insights and perspectives from different areas of the market and this industry. So we have uh, on the panel a registered investment advisor, Tom Marks, Thomas Marks. Dave Whitmore kind of represents more of the, the, the brokerage industry. And we have Jared Winters, who represents the kind of hedge fund world institutions. And we have Michael Moss, who's a, a data scientist, we'll call him, a financial data scientist whiz. Um, so the topic for this is kind of like democratization of AI and the future of financial decision making. So we're going to play around a little bit with this. Um, the idea is, is pretty clear. There, as I mentioned before, the, we are awash in data. And that's basically brought everyone, this democratization of data is one thing. But it hasn't quite led to the democratization of information. Right? All this data is almost, you, get, you start to miss the forest for the trees. And what's happening is that you're seeing this, again, trail of hedge funds that are closing for those who do not want to play this game of having to analyze data. But trade ideas certainly has a lot of competition. Um, the competition that we have is certainly in the form of hedge funds and large institutions who are using an army of PhDs, who are using their ton of capital to bring this technology uh, to the forefront of their performance. But who is that for? It's for their funded investors and not necessarily for the retail self-directed investor or her advisor. So the question I kind of want to start with is, let's do this. Let's do a quick round of introduction, just to uh, mention your name and uh, exactly what you do for, for everyone. Uh, share a little bit of your background for just a minute, and then we'll, we'll go through some targeted questions and then some, some rapid fire. That's, this is what we're going to talk about. Go ahead, Thomas. Yep. Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Marks. Uh, I reside in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I am with a firm called IFS Securities. Uh, we are a broker-dealer uh, headquartered in Atlanta, uh, offices across the country. Um, my background stems back uh, some 30 years, starting off in the banking business uh, in Tennessee, uh, and then as a financial advisor for a number of years, and then uh, as an institutional financial wholesaler for uh, firms like Hartford, Lincoln, uh, and the like. Um, and so now I'm uh, more as a RIA, uh, helping my firm and certain clients. Uh, also work with Trade Ideas in an advisory capacity and, uh, and have really enjoyed it. Uh, Dave Whitmore, um, E-Trade, senior strategist for our uh, trading education team where I really spent most of my time talking either on webinars or in person about the breadth of trading information, charts, fundamental analysis, option strategies, risk management, economics, et cetera. Um, my background is I grew up in Southern California. I live in New Jersey now. Uh, went to UC Santa Barbara, degree in business economics, and I have my MBA from NYU. Uh, and I started charting when I was in college. Uh, and when I came out and became a broker, at Payne Weber, at a, as a young kid, I was fascinated by Daily Graphs, the book that came uh, in the mail and you <laughs> took out your ink-stained pen and, and charted at and followed your charts that way, and it, I've been fascinated by it ever since. So it makes a, a big element of what we try to teach as far as uh, how to come up with ideas, and that's uh, uh, where I think this whole idea thing comes around, too. I think it makes some interesting conversation. So. Uh, Jared Winters, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Sunrise Capital Partners. Um, so let's see, my background was uh, for a short period of time in trading, and then uh, I became operations focused. Uh, a lot of it has to do with reporting and workflow, um, because uh, my clients are hedge funds, and their lifeblood is investors in their hedge funds, and you need to have reporting all the way out to those people. Um, my background, uh, educationally, I, I um, grew up in Texas, got in, uh, an MBA at Texas, uh, and, uh, and um, came out to Sunning, California, and then really cut my teeth uh, in the industry in New York City. Um, uh, having gone both on the bank side and now also on the institutional buy side uh, of the industry, uh, and having been exposed to as many hedge funds as I have in my career, it's been, uh, been eye-opening to tell the differences between what uh, you know, in individual traders have to contend with, and what institutions, you know, what 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 world they're playing in. 
Uh, Michael Noss, um, I guess uh, my education background is I'm a Chartered Alternative Investment Analyst, um, a Derivatives Market Specialist, and a Certified Market Technician. Um, I've basically taken those and not done much with them, and now I am an algo trader uh, and working with trade ideas. Um, but initials, man, those initials are great. Those initials. <laughs> uh, on top of that, I, I run a, a small YouTube channel. Um, just search uh, Bonpara on YouTube. And I do some one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring and coaching, kind of teaching new traders that want to get into the algo and the auto trading space, uh, just kind of how to get started, how to, how to start building, so. Okay, great. So we've got a good uh, baseline introduction, and the, the question I want to pose to, so one question I'll, I'd like all of you to answer, um, starting with Thomas here, is, you know, how, how, how do your clients, or how does your firm, how is your use of, of information from data evolved, and where do you think it's going? Yeah, it's, I mean, David, it's a great question. Um, I think, you know, as I think about our industry today and, and our firms, um, they are almost required to have to, to use data more efficiently in, in new ways that they've never had to use it before. I think especially for uh, us in the invi advice field, um, we're running up against a, uh, the Department of Labor's new ruling, whereas we may have only had to act in a suitability capacity for our clients. Now, the new rules being purported are we must act in a fiduciary capacity. Now, if you're, uh, if you're a good financial advisor, you've done that anyway all along. Right, right. It's just now the industry is going to mandate it. And I think it's this mandate, although we've just got a delay on the implementation for another 18 months around this, I do believe that um, data will be driven by these so-called new rules, however they end up playing out. Uh, and I think it particularly will be important for the advice community, those of us providing investment advice to our clients, whereas we can now perhaps even justify our actions around our fiduciary responsibility by using technology and data to do so. Right. Great, great point. So a couple layers here, um, you know, for instance, our marketing department applies data crunching and sourcing and all of that. Um, our social media team is following the social media stream and looking for patterns in commentary about our brand or our platforms. Um, but, you know, that's one part of it. I think maybe the more interesting part is how is the investor using this stuff? And what I find is that most aren't. Um, most, I, I mentioned this earlier when we spoke earlier, most trade the same old stocks and they just try to force a strategy or, or a pattern onto that instead of turning it around and waiting for the idea to come to them. Right. And uh, this, I've had this conversation with so many individual investors. You know, if you think back on that study that I quoted earlier, those were people who are a several notches above the typical individual investor. These are self-directed, identify themselves as, you know, moderately and uh, experienced and knowledgeable and even some professionals. But the great numbers of individual investors uh, uh, want ideas, but don't seem to know how to go about finding them. And, you know, that I think is a big challenge for firms like us. Um, I was thinking of all the uh, interesting ways, you know, in, in my company that we use data, and I was trying to think, you know, how was it used, you know, in yesterday's, you know, scenario, and how is it used today? And I'm tempted to say, in the institutional space where you're hedge fund and you have, you know, investors to your, your fund, um, that there's really very, very little change in the way that the data has applied. But that would be wrong. And the reason that, that, that I want to correct that is because it really has to do with the visibility on risk and, um, uh, and exposure, right? So uh, we're all familiar with what happened in 2008 with Madoff, um, and a lot of that has to do with the transparency uh, into um, trading and, uh, and, and, and positions and, uh, and into portfolios. Um, and there's a giant industry now of people who check on the accuracy of your records. Um, you cannot launch a fund these days without an administrator to that fund. So what does that mean? That means you literally have an auditor essentially doing everything for you. Like if someone invests with, with me, I can't touch their money. I can, I can tell them to go call up my service provider. 
Now, what does that ultimately mean? Is that there is a lot of data that is being transmitted from the service providers, and they have to hang on to it, you know, in, in a way that's secure. And there's, you know, there, there's rules around the the PII, the personally identifiable information, um, which are onerous. Okay, um, but uh, but but that's, you know, that's where I'm seeing it from the from, from the institutional side. It's not so much the you know, giant proliferation of data like we've seen in, in the options data growing monumentally. It's really in the, the personally identifiable information and the controls around it. Interesting. Uh, for me and my use of, of more data, more information, it, it really all boils down to probabilities, right? I'm, I'm able to make more informed decisions when it comes to my, my trading and my investing before because I'm able to, to simply figure out what happened in the past, right? As humans, we're always, whether you're day trading a stock or crossing the street, you're taking a, a, a chance, you're taking a probabilistic chance of, of what's gonna happen and, and evaluating risk reward. And I think, especially uh, for someone who trades for a living, uh, being able to use that data to make sure that at least in the past, that what you're doing is statistically likely to pay off uh, has definitely been huge. It's been huge for me, yeah. Okay. Um, a couple more questions here. What, uh, so, Let's take a step back here and, and look. It, it, you've talked about interesting uh, ways in which the da your data has been used and, and, and how you inf inform yourselves looking at the data. Um, if, we, if we look for a moment just at this innovation around artificial intelligence, and if we accept the premise that it's kind of here, it's not, gonna, it's not a fad, it's not gonna go away, what, what quick kind of round, what is your expectation for that delta what you, you would expect innovations like this artificial intelligence. And by the way, this is not like Lake Wobegon where every child is above average. What, what are some realistic you know, ways in which you think AI w w would gain or lose versus the index, which is always gonna be the, the benchmark, the S&P? I guess I'll just give you my own personal opinion. And that is with, with what I've seen, you know, as, as I, as you know, I'm an early adopter. As soon as Holly, you know, came out in uh, 2016, uh, I became uh, a subscriber in April of that year. Mm. Uh, so I'm basing this somewhat on what I've already seen. But um, based upon that and some of the other people that I know in the industry, I would expect there there would be some level con of consistency and some level of, you know, outperformance relative to an index. At least that would be what my expectations would be. I would also say that. Uh, based upon my perception of what the client thinks. I think the client would expect some level of outperformance uh, b because of the media, being driven by the media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a parallel here, or, uh, and that's with the whole field of what's now become known as robo-investing. Um, the, the idea that an algorithm and a simple set of rules and some simple filtering can build a portfolio that's suitable for reaching a goal. And the adoption of that is increasing across all age groups. Part of our study, by the way, that I didn't go into shows how millennials and Gen Xers and baby boomers take to the idea of a robo process. And it's increasing across all of them. There's increasing um, uh, expectations that that's a legitimate way to go about it. So my view would be, AI and trading and ideas is follow, is probably going to follow a similar path of adoption. Um, so I think it sets the groundwork. I also think there's another way that when you get people onto an AI approach to stock ideas, it's gonna draw some into tweaking it themselves in much the way Michael was talking about and, and getting under the hood and themselves and becoming more involved themselves. So I think, I think it's got a sort of a cross-pollination going there that I think probably has future to it in my, my sense. So I think AI, artificial intelligence, I think it's a buzzword phrase. Um, at its core, what is it? It's a, it's a set of tools. Um, I know that when I have uh, investor due diligence meetings and someone will come in and they'll have their long list of questions, one of the questions is, does Sunrise use artificial intelligence? Well, the answer is yes. 
but there's no follow-up question because they don't have to, they don't have the knowledge to, to, to ask a follow-up question. At the end of that, with that, yes, the box is checked. Now, what the fact is you really need someone like Michael or th these guys up here to actually use the tool and take some of the, the core fundamental bases, if you will, uh, and use the, use the tools appropriately. So w we're gonna keep seeing that, but, but I think for now, people have to at least take that grain of salt, realize that AI, the, the, the phrase, is a veneer, and there's, there's actually something underneath it. You have to, you have to you know, probe it. Yeah. Uh, so for me, I, I think where artificial intelligence stands right now is it's a great assistant. Now, it may, in the future, it may be come to replace everything, but, you know, when I get in my car and I'm going to a new, new place, I use Google Maps, which has some sort of embedded AI to tell me where to go. I can talk to my wrist to turn on and off my lights, and it knows that I roughly go to bed at the same time, and it, it starts to dim the lights for me. None of these are replacing things that I normally do. I'm still driving, right? I'm, you know, sometimes... Uh, the Google Maps will tell you to go down this one road, but you live in the town, you know it's just going to be crazy that time of day, and, and you take a different route. And, and same when it comes to trading and, and with the AI and that kind of stuff, is that it, it's, it's providing you uh, a nice back-tested edge, but it's providing you that as a tool. So then you can actually use that the same as you would a Google Maps or, or something similar, where you can say, okay, yes, this is what the, the advisor or the AI or whatever is telling me to do, and then I can interject with my own trader brain, with my own experience, um, and, and course correct as needed. So right now, I'd say it's the most powerful tool out there. Uh, how far it's gonna go, I, I'm not too sure, but yeah, I think a, a, a digital assistant is, is the best way to kind of look at it right now. I think that's a great point. I think, you know, it's, as in life, you have to know sometimes when you're on the path, and of equal value is also knowing when you're off the path, right? So that you know I'm taking something that's outside of where, you know, that's outside of the plan, but when you know that. The trouble is when you don't know, when you don't have a plan and, and you don't know whether you're off it or, or not. Um, so that's great. There was something interesting that was also brought up in this last you know, uh, question, and that was about the, uh, something that, that hasn't been brought up, I think, the, uh, today or yesterday, but I think, Dave, you were mentioning this about the growth of um, passive investments versus active, right? There's an inflection point coming where passive will, I think it's, 2022 or so, that passive invest assets under management will overtake those of active um, because there's the mentality that we talked before about the frustration every, everybody is going through, and that's among self-directed investors, advisors, and even hedge funds that the ones that close particularly have the sensation that it's just too hard, the game has changed, and we don't have the tools to adapt to how the market structure is changing. So the set it and forget it, which is seductive, uh, claims everyone's assets, flows into these passive investments that are tied to the index. And I read more and more articles about how, now active investing is not gonna go away. So the question becomes, how will they adapt? And I'm starting to see certain articles about active in, uh, investment tactics to deal with stocks that are about to flow into you know, the indices, about to be uh, the indices that are tracked by these passive um, investment vehicles. Um, I guess quick kind of question would be related to that. Who are who are likely to be the winners and losers in in the financial you know, space moving forward? Whether you think it's AI that's the that, that's the catalyst for change or or, or this active or passive. Um, let's go in the reverse order. Start with Mike this time and uh, tell me who you think the winners and losers are. I, I think the biggest winners will be. Uh, the quickest to adapt and the quickest to change. You know, if, uh, large banks, you know, sometimes you walk into a, a bank and you look at the, what they're doing, their, you know, checking and, and savings account in, it looks like it's running on MS-DOS from a thousand years ago. It's, th the bigger they seem to, to be, the harder it is to, to turn that battleship and, and to adapt to new technologies. So I think just like in a lot of firms, you know, looking at, at places like Uber and, and this type of thing, where they, they saw a device be created, and then quickly created a business based off that, I think those will be the greatest winners, the ones that are, are the quickest to adapt, but also understand what they're doing instead of, you know, you, you brought up the example of the firm that dumped everything into one algo. It, it's, um, it's very, it's dangerous to adapt and to be an early adopter here, but I think the way technology is growing, things are moving too quickly to, to be behind the, the eight ball at all. Uh, I'm, I'm going to mostly agree with that, except I think it's not the uh, the, the, the smartest first mover. I think it's going to be the smartest second mover. Um, 
you know, uh, I'll take the example that, that we see, you know, we're, we're now a couple of years into this, uh, the robo uh, phase. I mean, I guess to the point where calling it robo now is already out of fashion. Um, but, you know, the, the initial entree of it was, you know, hardcore, just passive investing. You, you're, you're an investor, great, you go in this passive vehicle. Hey, I'm also an investor, you go in this passive vehicle. And that's what they're all doing. All the betterments, the wealth front, they're all doing the same. The idea of it actually being robo, it's just the interface. Hmm. There's not any genuine intelligence differentiating this investor from that investor. I suppose that's, I'm, I'm painting with a very broad brush here and I recognize that, but, but that's what we're seeing, the, the big growth in, in the passive investing. And so to the idea of like, where are the assets going? I mean, we've heard people saying or today that, uh, that hedge funds are going away. They're not going away, they're just consolidating. And it's where, where people don't know, you know the answer, when people don't have a clear view on the future, what do they do? There's not a flight to quality, there's a flight to gravity. Right, so there's you. You want to go with the biggest fund out there, right? But that, by the way, that's where the next bubble's coming. <laughs> so there's a couple of questions in our study that that speak to this. Um, when one was about passive versus active, and two, I'll recall two facts from it. One, the uh, appreciation for a passive approach in the very basic asset classes was profound but it was recognized that that was appropriate for broad, large cap, um, top asset classes. And the interest in it goes way down as you go down the asset class uh, ladder. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. And it, it, it also- Sorry, repeat that again. You're saying the interest in the asset class goes down- No, the interest in passive, a passive, passive approach right. is far lower as we get into things like um, Foreign small cap stocks, or, small or cap you know, stocks. smaller cap stocks. There's a recognition that active stock picking is, is necessary in right. those areas. Great. So that's one observation of it. The other one is another one of these fun questions that we use. Um, we asked uh, millennials, Gen Xers, and baby boomers whether they wanted their financial broker, loosely described, to be more R2D2 or C3PO. And you're thinking, what? <laughs> so R2-D2 is described as a jack of all trades, a willing to provide you sophisticated tools or help to get there on your own, a way to be your companion uh, who would adapt to you. Hmm. C-3PO, all he would do is spit out advice and tell you what to do, and nobody wanted that. So you know, I, I think if you bring those together, two things together, who are gonna be the winners? Well, I like to think E-Trade is gonna be one of the winners in that, but, but you know. By the way, new this Star This commercial Wars. message brought new, to you by? New, <laughs> new, well, and new Star Wars trailer to drop, I think, this week or something, you know, for uh, summer of next year. Can't wait. That, that, continue, that uh, ends my comment. Very good, very good. Thomas, let's yep. hear from you. Well, let me drop a bomb on everybody here. Oh, no. Because as soon as the Federal Reserve stops messing around with these markets, I can promise you active will become more, much more important than passive. It's happened every cycle and it will happen again. It's just a question of when, not if, but when. And when that time comes, active investing will certainly be very important. Uh, and to your point, yes, you know, the, the, the smaller caps certainly have lended themselves more to the active folks on that side, but that's just my perspective. Well, feel free to drop the mic on that one, Thomas. Um, so, uh, so let's see, we've got just a couple of minutes left. We've got, these are great minds up here. I'm sure you've got some questions that, uh, that the, you'd like to address the panel. Perfect, let's go ahead. Let me repeat the question just for the panel for your sake, Thomas. Your question is about uh, with the, the DOL's uh, rule being delayed 18 months, does that, uh, is there a future where AI will take in such fiduciary considerations and help with the actual execution of a trade as it relates to, or deny the trade, or deny the trade as it relates to um, unique, unique risk profile of the trader? Okay, 
I've got certainly opinion on that. Um, go ahead, Thomas. <laughs> I, I think it's a great question. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities. Um, I, I, uh, I think it's going to see, and we're going to see an evolution, and that evolution could quite possibly include that outcome. Um, uh, I, as I had said earlier, I, I think that uh, the new DOL rulings, as it, you know, as a, as a RIA, I have to have that fiduciary level of care for my client. Uh, and what the regulators are trying to do is push that on the entire industry, uh, good, bad, right, or wrong. And they're, just understand there, there are uh, unintended consequences to every decision that's made, some good, some bad. Um, and I know what my industry is arguing for reasons why we shouldn't go to there. But, again, these are, you know, you know, bigger questions. Uh, all I'll say is that it is driving, I think, a need for technology amongst those traditional brokerage firms, be they the, the wirehouses, the Merrill Lynch, you know, the, the types, the independent financial advisors, the RIAs. It's all driving the technology that I think will be able to allow um, that higher fiduci fiduciary level of care in a much more efficient manner. I see it. I mean, it had not occurred to me where you were going there, but I do see that that could be very helpful for a retail brokerage firm to see things like fraud, um, acting in concert, uh, to see things that might not be so obvious without sort of, you know, manually going through histories, um, a stop sign coming up or recognizing uh, patterns. I, I can see that being applied in the future. Let, let, me, let me just say that in, in, from my context, I don't think you will see that unless it's part of an integrated whole where the technology is hand in hand with not just the broker, but an advisory function as well. And I say that because uh, tr currently as we exist, as trade ideas exist, we are, we are an independent firm. We, are not, we do not advise our, our you know, individual subscribers. That's left up to that individual, their risk profile, and their advisor, who may or, you know, be using trade ideas on behalf of the client, or you know, the client using it and, and passing some ideas across to the advisor to say, should I be doing this? But we don't step into that, and we wouldn't unless we were part of a fuller uh, brokerage and an advisory uh, role, where something like that would only come out of, um, out of compliance and out of this uh, ability to, to give who is giving the advice here. It has to be very clear about um, the advisory part of a brokerage would be, not necessarily the software. So it's possible, but it would have to go through quite a bit of, uh, it has to be clear where that advice is coming from. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I think given your um, hypothetical, uh, first of all, I don't even think that it takes the fiduciary rule uh, coming into play uh, for that, because that has more to do with the, the, the the type of vehicle and what what, uh, what an investor is paying for commissions and, and the management fee, um, but what you bring up has to do with suitability, uh, and it has to do with you know rules. Uh, those rules already exist, and whether they'll be implemented electronically or not is just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're an 85 year old person with a fixed income, um, there's probably a brokerage you know uh, rule out there that says don't let them short sell. Not appropriate. Not suitable. Um, Right now, those things are not necessarily implemented electronically, but that, that, that day's coming. Feel free to, okay, let's take another question. <laughs> let's take another question. Let me grab Dan over here. Let me try to recap the question. So the question is, from your vantage point, using the technology, mm -hmm. and given what before the technology others would have to do, the, the hours spent researching through charts to look for setups, how are you using, what's your homework like using uh, the virtual analyst and the technology behind trade ideas? What's part of that new routine that you do at night, if at all? So it, nope. it, for me, it's about once a, once a week. It takes maybe a, a couple hours on the weekend, but um, it always starts 10,000 trades plus, and, and that's generally done by the back tester in under 30 seconds, I would say. So total amount of trades that I've tested, refining my six strategies all the way down, you'd be 
you'd be in the neighborhood of 100,000 separate trades and separate events. And, and one thing I've actually learned a lot um, I've, is that you notice patterns in the patterns when you're doing the back testing. I, I've started to gravitate to filters that seem to affect things more than, more than others. Um, uh, you know, indicators that, that may be a little bit more important in certain situations and not important in others. And, and I think that's a really good point because back in the day, if you wanted to design a new trading strategy, you'd come up with the idea, you'd have to wait for the market to open again, you'd have to sit down, you'd have to watch it trade each and every day and that takes weeks or months to refine. And yeah, I can do um, 100,000 plus trades in an afternoon you know, with Netflix up on the other monitor as opposed to having to sit and, and watch the entire thing. So yeah, it's, it's quite a lot of data, but you know, I, again, uh, I'm not a programmer, not from MIT, anything like that. It's just you click simulate by and away it goes. You're either hoping you're with him or you're not against him. Um, yeah, I think it was mentioned earlier before about the, 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 you know, having screen time. Well, that may still be true to be a good, you know, investor in the market, but it's just that definition of screen time has changed and the quality of what that screen time is going to be is also changed so that you're not actually um, spending hours seeing things develop, but you're spending s or days or months waiting for things to develop. You're spending hours or seconds to really get through what would be simulated screen time otherwise. Um, Dave, do you have any thoughts about this question about how, you know, uh, the, the time that even, you know, the technology on the, on the pro platform or, or otherwise is, is, is helping? Well, I mean, completely to echo the discussion there, the ability to heavy lift that many, that many examples and get a statistical readout. When I, when I show the back tester to uh, maybe a, a trade show, or maybe I'm in our booth talking to people about it, and I show them that, and I show them what, you know, it goes back, 6,000 trades are identified. First thing I say is, we're not expecting you to do 6,000 trades, you know. Um, but the point is, is that you get a real set of data that gives you some understanding, so you have a, a sense of probability. And I think that that is one of the, the profound applications of that. Um, and I think it's one of the, in, in a way, I think we hide it a little bit. Um, and I think it is a very important element it goes back to what I was saying about how if, you sh if you're going to show them the ideas through artificial intelligence, a lot of people will then want to say, okay, wait a minute, let me see how you That's got right. there, and they'll want to then open up the hood, and that That's benefits right. the, whole, That's right. the whole spectrum, I right. think. Maximum value on the first impression. Uh, let's take a couple more questions. Clayton. Um, so kind of uh, follow up on the winners and losers question, and David, the slide you put up about the different changes, you know, from SOs to decimalization to HFTs. Um, the SOs ban this one because they could exploit their small size, you know, and all sorts of rules. The HFT guys ex exploited latency. Um, how do you think people will exploit AI to gain an edge? If more and more people use it, if everybody uses AI, you know, kind of how will that evolve? So I'll recap, but basically, how, how if everyone starts using AI, how will the markets evolve? Um, that's a good question. So it's a moving target, right? So it'll be uh, as AI leads people into a certain area or strategy, those profits are going to get are going to get arbed out, and that's going to pop out on the other side and create opportunities elsewhere. And I would say that AI would have the again, this is beyond my pay grade too, but the ability to see that there's an inefficiency in another part of the market that that would be exploited. That would be my sense of that. Well, and I've actually, I've built, um, again, I'm currently running about six algorithms, but I've probably built 30, right? Th there, there will come a point where it's beyond repair. Maybe it's not working in this current market environment. Uh, maybe, maybe it will come back later, but, or maybe whatever that thing that I was looking for, as you mentioned, got exploited by everyone else and now it's gone, which again, I think is one of the main benefits of something that Holly does where I've built uh, algorithms for Holly that I haven't seen in six months. They're just not performing in this market. So they get shelved and they get buried. And I'm sure they're getting still run through the back tester. And then when it, when it comes back again, 
you know, uh, uh, hopefully it's working a little bit better. So I think the, I think that's another thing that's going to um, give an advantage to the people that are willing to adapt quickly and, and the people that are willing to switch. Um, again, I, I, I mentor a lot of students that are getting into this and a lot of people, they'll get attached to an algorithm. They're, I spent 30 hours on this trying to build and it doesn't work anymore. And you almost have to treat them like employees if, if, you, you're, if you're a salesman, if you're running a, a car shop, right? You, if you stop selling, you bring him in, you talk to him, you try to help him out. And then if he's gone altogether, you're just gonna have to get rid of him. Which again, that's, um, Dave was talking about the, the algorithm combine, where it picks the best maybe five out of, I think, 40 or so each and every day. Uh, I think that's a huge advantage, which again, we have as, as retail investors, where this isn't working anymore, bury it, put it on a shelf somewhere, come back in six months, see if it's working and move on. Where, you know, a large hedge fund or something may have to go through committee meeting after committee meeting after committee meeting to try to see if they're gonna turn off that algo and, and, and turn on another one. It's, it's very Game of Thrones-like. We'll just cut it off and say <laughs> like, that one, when we come back in another storyline some other day. Yeah. Um, we've gotta wrap it up. Uh, I know there's a lot more questions, so feel free to, to ping any of these fine people uh, for the cocktail hour, but I wanna thank each and every one of you for, for bringing your contribution. <laughs>